Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of History Quest. This month we're going to talk a little bit about the history of Christmas, some of the traditions in McLeod County, and a little bit of a story from World War I at Christmas time. And we might even dive into our own personal Christmas traditions, because why not? It's, yeah. fun, it's fun to get nostalgic. No, not maybe. What? Maybe. So it's Christmas time. Do you have your tree yet? Yes, we do have our tree up. Is it a real one or artificial? It is Fake. an artificial one, but I cut it down myself. I went to the department store <laughs> with an ax. Well, I actually just borrowed an ax from the tool section <laughs> and I go. found the tree I liked and I cut it down and I got out of there before anybody <laughs> could call the cops. It was amazing. Hashtag things that happen at Walmart. Oh yeah. Yeah. Watch YouTube. You might see it. No. Over Thanksgiving weekend, we actually went to a tree farm with my family and we did saw down our Christmas tree. I'm the city girl who grew up in St. Paul who goes to a tree farm every year and saws down her tree. Take that. <laughs> and, I'm the, and I'm the guy from the small town with relatives who live out on farms and mm -hmm. you know, all this access to, to free trees. trees. And I go to the department store and cut down an artificial one. How's that feel? Very daring. <laughs> Very daring. <laughs> no, anyway. I love the real tree and I love the smell of it and I love how big they can get because we have decades worth of ornaments. Mm -hmm. My mom still has theirs from, or her, excuse me, from her childhood and all of us kids have our own and it just fills the tree. Like we need those ones with like a five foot diameter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I like Christmas trees. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I do. I really do. <laughs> I'm actually at my house, I'm kind of in charge of a Christmas tree. Go figure that dad is in charge of the Christmas tree. Normally dad's just in charge of the lights, you know, and taking them out and trying not to freak out while you're taking the lights out and untangling this giant mess of lights, mm -hmm. you know, and then the kids are all like, when are we gonna put the lights on the tree? When are you gonna put the star on the tree? I wanna put this on the tree. And you're like, let me get the lights <laughs> untangled first and then I can put them on the tree. And you know, so, but no, actually the whole Christmas tree is kind like of my thing. It's like a non-flashback or something. <laughs> <laughs> like that got really real for Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> a Christmas flashback. But yeah. So yeah, I guess everybody has their Christmas traditions. You did a little bit of research this month on some McLeod County Christmas trees. I did. Traditions. I'm really interested in the Bohemian, the Czech history of this area. So I did some research into those traditions and in the former Czechoslovakia, Czech Republic, Christmas starts on December 5th with St. Nicholas Day, or Mikolas in, in Czech, it's how it's pronounced. And it's only on December 5th that you really see a uh, Santa. Like between, during the whole month of December, you don't see Santa in the storefront windows or in local advertising or at the mall. He's just not part of the overall Christmas holiday in Czech. But on December 5th, St. Nicholas comes down and he has the full beard and he's dressed in red and white, but he looks more like a bishop. And he'll march through towns, the bigger towns. You see this in Prague also. But he has some friends with him because as the legend goes that St. Nicholas visits, visits the Czech Republic from heaven and he's lowered down from heaven on a golden rope by an angel who accompanies him but he also comes with the devil <laughs> and the three of them will march through town and ask children like have you been good this year and usually the kids will say they have by reciting a poem or something good they've done or singing a carol and if they if they do well the angel gives them candies or sweets or a small treat if they don't do what's expected of them, the devil will give them a like a potato <laughs> or a piece of coal. <laughs> and that, and that's, and it only happens that one day, but it's this big festival, especially in Prague. It draws thousands of people and you go to the old town square and you'll see St. Nicholas and the angel and the devil doing their thing. <laughs> but then on December 4th, is when they really celebrate Christmas. It's Christmas Eve, the family gets together. You don't eat the whole day. You're not supposed to eat until you see the first star in the sky. How do you feel about that? Well, if you wake up early enough, the stars are still out, so. That's true, yeah. but it has to be Christmas Eve night. 
No cheating. No lo no loopholes. So like so you five o'clock. You can eat all day until until you see the first star. Until you see the first but star. But then <clears throat> your efforts are rewarded because you get a nine course meal. The f Ooh. All the family gets together. They sit around the table. Um, there's usually an extra spot left, an extra plate, and that's either to commemorate or to honor someone who may have passed that year, or it's to um, commemorate a Christian tradition of being hospital. If there's someone who doesn't have anywhere to celebrate or somewhere who needs a home, there's a spot for them. So that's really sweet. But it's this giant meal and carp is the main dish. Not turkey or ham, it's carp. And it's a big deal in the Czech. Carp are bottom feeders, so immigrants to the US couldn't, they had to find some other fish to eat. But you'll see in towns, these um, fishermen are selling carp. It's just the streets are lined with with, <laughs> with carp, basically. The carp are still living. And sometimes families will buy the carp like a week ahead of time and just keep them in the family bathtub and the kids will have like a little pet for, <laughs> for a week and then they cook it. <laughs> but everyone eats around the table and you have to sit at the table for the entire meal. The first person to get up from the table is, the, they're gonna die that I year. Die. So you break the curse, you finish the meal, you don't see your plate and everyone gets up from the table at the same time. And that, that evens things out, I guess. <laughs> and they open presents after the meal. And it's not Santa who brings the present. It's actually baby Jesus. Jesus. Baby Jesus comes. He crawls through the window. Kids write letters to baby Jesus the weeks before Christmas telling him what they want. He lives in the mountains in the Czech Republic. And he comes down on Christmas Eve. And all the kids, they don't, they don't eat the meal anywhere near the Christmas tree because they can't see baby Jesus. But they know that he's been there when a bell is rung. So the parents will lay out the presents from baby Jesus, they'll ring the bell, and that's when the kids know that baby Jesus <laughs> visited, visited their home. And they gather, they eat the meal, they open their presents, they sing carols, that's all around the house. But Christmas is observed on the 25th and the 26th. Now, the 26th traditionally is when children and teachers would go sing carols, they'd visit the neighbors, knock on the door, but now it's more of a day just to stay home and relax. So they were reading it, people really appreciate how it is now, because you get, you get everything done, quote unquote, on Christmas Eve, and then you can just spend the rest of the holiday relaxing with your family or visiting relatives who couldn't come to your house for Christmas dinner. But so, so was this... These traditions were still alive when the Czechs came to McLeod yeah, County. Yeah, the baby Jesus myth is actually 400 years old. So wow. Santa, so Santa is a lot newer, and you again, you don't see him anywhere except on December 5th, Saint Nicholas Day. He's not a big part of their culture like it is in the United States. But oh, and one thing, and after dinner, um, everyone slices an apple, and how the core looks will reflect how the rest of the year is gonna go. If you see a star in the core, it means you're gonna have good luck and prosperity. But if it's a four corner star, if it looks like a cross, you're, you're kinda doomed. <laughs> you might, you're gonna have bad luck. But people, but people try to counteract that bad luck if they have it. People will save a fish scale from the carp that they eat and it resembles a silver dollar. So the legend is if you Take a scale from your Christmas dinner and keep it in your wallet. It will bring you prosperity and wealth the rest of the year. There you have it, folks. There's all <laughs> kinds of checks walking around McLeod County with carp scales in their wallets. But there's actually in Silver Lake, the Holy Family Catholic Church will still sing hymns in Czech around the holidays. Mm. They'll bring out the Christmas carols and sing them in Czech because there is still a lot of people with, with that strong heritage who mm -hmm. live in the area. Oh, I'd love to go to their service, actually. It sounds like fun. Well, you tell me all about it. Mm. <laughs> about the carp. <laughs> yeah, you eat the carp and tell me how it tastes. I've never had carp. You probably don't ever want to, either. <laughs> I don't know. It's kind of like, it's, it's kind of like a cross between lutefisk and, uh, and uh, you know, um, lutefisk and maybe a piece of wood or you know some oh uh, yeah. i have eaten lutefisk you and have what eaten lutefisk? i have and it's not as bad as people say it is honestly it's got a bad rap looks like a jar of vaseline got emptied on your plate but, <laughs> but it tastes good oh. a lot of things that don't look appetizing taste good yeah yeah <laughs> well anyway but 
Yeah, but it was a lot of fun learning about these traditions because, you know, we have Santa Claus everywhere in American culture, and he looks so different. <clears throat> <laughs> Sorry, I'm in a festive mood today, as you can see. Mm -hmm. And just all these, all these myths about wealth and prosperity and bad luck and like get everyone getting up from the table at the same time because you don't want the first person to get up will get bad luck or keeping a fish scale in your wallet or the apple core um there's also one you put a candle in an empty walnut shell and you put the walnut in a bowl of water and like depending on how the boat reacts will determine your future <laughs> like if it if it sinks you're gonna die if it <laughs> If it forms a circle with another boat or two other boats, then that represents new friendship and, and gathering and community. Hmm. Whatever floats your boat, I guess. I guess, yeah. yeah. So you know how Christmas got started, right? <laughs> this is not a joke. This is real. You know how Christmas got started. How did right? Christmas get started? So it was traditionally a pagan holiday to celebrate the winter solstice, which mm -hmm. falls on December 21st. Mm -hmm. And during the winter solstice, they had these, uh, you know, kind of, uh, <clears throat> well, let me backtrack a little bit. So winter time was always considered a time of like death, basically. Your harvest is over mm -hmm. um, and harvest is, you know. Life. A, yeah, life. Your harvest is over. Your days are the shortest of the year. The leaves have fallen off the trees. The grass is dead. Yep. You know, you're just sad. It's a real right? Christmas spirit. It's, Everything up, dies. Up, up, up. <laughs> Who, this is where the Christmas spirit comes into play, right? So, so what they do is the villagers go out and they find a log mm -hmm. and they bring it into the village and they basically put part of the log in this big fire. And then we're not talking like, you know, just this little log. We're talking like a log, you know? <laughs> and so they bring this log in and they set the first part of the log on the fire. And uh, as that burns, they just keep on bringing the log into the fire. Mm -hmm. Now, you may so have guessed it, they called it the Yule log. <gasps> <Yeah>. <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> Yeah, it all really blows your mind, doesn't it? <laughs> so anyway. totally didn't see it coming. <laughs> Twist. So everything. they celebrate, and they, and they do this, of course, on the winter solstice. And they, soon as the Yule log is done burning, then the festival is over. And then, of course, you know they feast during the festival and all this mm -hmm. stuff. And then also a tradition that we still have today was the pagans would go out and they would cut down a pine tree because a pine tree and pine boughs and all kinds of holly and stuff like that because it's green during the time of death. So it basically symbolizes mm. life during this dark period. So they bring mm -hmm. the tree into the house and what are the, do they decorate it? I don't know, but they do bring this tree into the house, let the mm -hmm. whole house smell like the tree, you know, and it's all smell. cheery and Christmassy and the Yule log and happy cheery festival. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's how Christmas gets started. Now it turns into Christmas when Chris, the Christians are trying to convert the pagans to Christianity. Now, the Christians say that we are celebrating the birth of Jesus, but actually historians and, uh, you know, us, but not us, say that uh, the birth of Jesus actually happens in July. Mm -hmm. You know, so, hey, fireworks, you're celebrating the birth of Jesus. But uh, in all seriousness, mm -hmm. um, the Christians say, well, why don't we just make, you know, our most uh, significant holiday fall roughly on the same date as the uh, pagans' most significant holiday of the mm -hmm. year. And we can just kind of integrate ours into them. Basically, they're crashing the party. The Christians are crashing the pagans' winter solstice party. But and, it worked out. But it all worked out because, you know, it... it the, the tree and all this other stuff and mm -hmm. it just it just kind of worked out but that's uh, that's kind of your basis basis mm -hmm. for christmas yeah yeah my uh my well my ancestors your ancestors most of them came from europe right now so i have a very rich german heritage you know okay and so the tradition for a lot of germans which mcleod county has a lot of is sausage at christmas mm. and uh so, hmm. yeah, I know, go figure. Is uh, so leading up to Christmas, you know, you'd butcher a hog and you'd make your sausage, and then on Christmas Eve you would go to your midnight mass, and then you would come home and you would eat sausage. You why know? not? Yeah, why not? It's sausage. Sausage and eh? carp. Oh, no, no carp. Just sausage. 
<laughs> just sausage. But uh, what, what's interesting is uh, my family, or well, one half of my family, we typically make our sausage right about Christmas time. Oh, really? Still to this day. My grandpa will always talk about when he was a kid and the midnight mass and the sausage. Mm. And actually, they did something similar to the St. Nicholas thing. Mm -hmm. They would have, I don't know what day it fell on, but uh, they would have St. Nicholas go around to the houses and, uh, you know, bring this little toy or little gift or whatever mm -hmm. to the kids. But they also would have somebody dress up as, uh, like, the demon or the whatever. Um, the I, devil. Yeah, I, I don't know if they, they called it the devil or what, but he said that his mother, my great-grandmother, was the one who would always, or, or at least a couple of times, had dressed up as this demon person oh, really? and went around, because the demon would go around first and scare the kids through the window. Uh -huh. And what's funny is, I remember my great-grandmother, and if you knew her, she was perfect for that part, <laughs> let me tell you what. But, yeah. So those are some of my, <laughs> you know, Christmas traditions. But, yeah, typically we just do the, we do the old, you know... Christmas Eve party and mm -hmm. you know the whole Santa Claus thing and actually I'm going to see Santa Claus on uh, Saturday with my with my little Hi. boy. Yep, yep. He's gonna see him first. And I'm gonna see him second, and I already know what I'm gonna ask for. Did you know that like our image of Santa, the big belly, the rosy cheeks, the white beard, was invented by Coca-Cola? Was it really? Yeah. Well, thank you, Coca-Cola. <laughs> You know, because there there are images from this from the Civil War era of cartoons, and there's there was no common theme. He was skinny. He was short. He looked like an elf. He was tall and fat. There was no. But then a cartoonist for Coca Cola it came time for advertising, and he used the the story um, the, "Twas the Night Before Christmas" as as inspiration for this jolly Santa, this big, happy old man with a pot full of jelly and rosy cheeks. And you know, Coca Cola's advertising is incredible, and it's you know it spread everywhere. It was in magazines, on billboards, on posters, and it just, it just became Santa. Like, you can't imagine Santa skinny. You can't imagine him without a beard. You can't imagine him without his red coat and, and white trim. <laughs> so it's, you know, but it's been that way since the 1930s that the Coca-Cola Santa has been Santa. <laughs> interesting. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So there is one story that I want to share, and this is um, a World War I story. And it happens, it's called the Christmas Truce. And you may, have, you may have heard it before. Um, before I get into it, I'll just, you know, I'll give a, the quick run through. And uh, what it is, um, both sides on Christmas Eve decide to lay down their arms and have a little Christmas shindig right out on no mm -hmm. man's land and, mm -hmm. and the battlefields of World War I. So, mm -hmm. yeah. France, December 24th, 1914. It was indeed hell. By far the most horrific thing in human history to that time. An angel of death riding high across Europe, leaving nothing more than a mangled and lifeless world in his wake. To wit, it was five months into the Great War, a war thought to be over by Christmas. Yet, it was only the beginning. It was Christmas Eve. The sun had finished its descent into the western sky and night had fallen. The darkness brought with it cold, and temperatures dipped below freezing. The young soldiers in the British trenches, their damp wool uniforms began to freeze. They were huddled together for warmth, and doing their best to ignore the frost that crept into their wet feet. An overcast crept into the sky and obstructed the dim light cast by the moon and stars. It turned the battlefield into pitch blackness. Soon, a light, fluffy snow began to fall. It floated to the ground like winter confetti. It would have normally been a welcome sight on a Christmas Eve, but as it collected on the brims of the steel helmets and gun barrels, it was nothing more than a reminder that the world was at war and that the warm, cheery joy of home, family, and Christmas Eve was a world away. Across no man's land, toward the German trenches, in silhouetted by rotting corpses of dead comrades and mangled remains of the French countryside, activity was spotted. A warm glow appeared to hover over the enemy lines, and voices were heard. The Germans were lighting candles, and their talking was indicative of a charge over the top. Thoughts of home on Christmas Eve were suddenly dashed as the young British soldiers readied themselves for the attack. They scrambled to take up defensive positions, checked their weapons, and braced themselves. They were gripped by fear, and many began to pray that they would not meet their end in the cold trenches on a Christmas Eve. They watched waited, yet the Germans were not charging. Rather, an eerie silence fell about the battlefield. 
Nothing more could be heard than the sound of the soft snow gently floating to the ground. A single voice was heard from the German trench, a melodious voice rising in tone, singing the words, Still knocked, helig knocked. Though the words were not understood by most of the Brits, the melody was unmistakable. The man in the enemy trench was singing, Silent Night. Others in the enemy trench began singing as well, and soon the entire German line had joined in, singing loudly and casting a cheery yet strange feel to fall over the battlefield. The Brits were confused. It was only a matter of time before the Brits decided to return fire, so to speak, and began to sing along to the same songs, only in English. Christmas morning dawned. It was cold, white, and frosty. Some were uncertain if what happened in the night was real or if it was just a dream. To be sure, the Brits were still wary of an attack. Suddenly, a German helmet atop a rifle was raised high above the enemy trench. A voice rang out in German, Nick Schieben, Nick Schieben. Don't shoot. We don't want to fight today. British officers, still wary of an attack, ordered their men to keep their heads down and stay ready. Then, a British lieutenant broke ranks and climbed out of the trench. He drew no enemy fire, but rather, a German officer rose from the enemy trench as well and made his way forward. In his hands was a tiny Christmas tree, and on his face was a smile. When the two met, rather than exchanging gunfire, they simply shook hands and said, Merry Christmas. I think what is the most essential Christmas song out there that says Christmas like no other song says Christmas. What? How about, how, uh, deck the halls. Okay, fine. All right, All right. ready? All right. Here we go. go. 